everyone praise the lord everyone praise the lord everyone hallelujah hallelujah we made it another day hallelujah made it to the house of the lord hallelujah let's bless his name on this morning he's been so good hallelujah thank you jesus
name, Jesus. Hallelujah.
refreshing to your soul. I said, is that not refreshing to your soul? You know, there's nowhere like being in his presence. Things in this world come and they go. But the one place we know we can do it right, that we know we can be all right, is in his presence. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, give God glory. He's just worthy anyway. To the band and to the praise and worship, awesome, awesome, awesome. God bless you, Corinth. Ah, that's one of the reasons we come to church. You know, David made a statement in Psalms. He said, my heart panneth like, uh, he said, like the heart. My soul panneth in the desert. And it's something about when you're in God's presence and he refreshes you. He refreshes us like the dew in the morning. <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm trying to move on. But you know, there's sometimes you just want to be still and know that he's God. And that's enough all by itself. Sometimes we move too much. We think too much. We do too much. But that best place is that still place. Amen. Let's look to the Lord. Let's pray. Take your time, young lady. You can stay at all service if you like. That's what the altar's for. That's what the altar's for. Amen. God bless you. can't bring it to the altar. We ain't got nowhere else to bring it. Now, I mean, when you run out the altar, you done. It's a wrap. But thank God there is altar. Because the altar is the foot, the footstool to the cross where the Lord makes things right. Well, welcome those of you joining us by various forms of social media. We trust today's message will touch your heart, your mind, your body, the very depths and the intersections of your soul to bring you peace, to bring you that joy from everlasting to everlasting. Father God, we thank you. We so praise you. We so give you all the glory, all the honor, especially, Lord God, in this hour. 
and adverse times, Lord. But your word declares when we are weak, then you are strong. That you are the ancient of the days, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. That you sit high, but you look low. Oh, how we love you today. We thank you, Lord. Hearts will be refreshed and minds renewed. That, Father, you would do the exceeding, you would do the abundant. Above all that we ask or think in this hour, Lord, I thank you, Lord, and decree, Lord, in the manifestation of these times, you'll give us back the day that the locusts have eaten and the canker worm has stolen. I thank you, Lord, that there's a time of restoration in the midst of adversity, a time of blessing, a time of peace. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. And those that agreed said, Amen. You may be seated in his presence. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Um, we're teaching on a subject, the adversities, the adversities of faith. We're teaching on the subject, the adversities of faith. And I thank God for the opportunity to teach on this as we are living without question in adverse times. Uh, but even more so, it is a time to put our faith to work. Uh, I had the <clears throat> opportunity to spend time with the Lord uh, on this week and to do some refreshing uh, within my own soul and to go before God and I took the time to just kind of review and take a panoramic view of the Word of God and just kind of started in Genesis and just for my own refreshing. And in that, I was reminded of the goodness of God. And when I say reminded, not that I forgot, but how many of us know there are so many uh, reasons to give God praise, so many reasons to be thankful. Amen. And, uh, you know, it's a blessing to have a mind to know that. Sometimes we think that that's an automatic thing, and it's not necessarily an automatic thing. You know, uh, it's a blessing to be clothed with a mind to even think on God. Because there's a lot of people right now, they, they, they can't even muster the thought. They can't even track the thought of God. And that's a sad thing. Because we need God in these days and times like we have never needed the Lord before. And I can't think of a, a, a greater message to uh, renew ourselves with than the message of understanding that while we're in these adverse times, that God is still doing the exceeding. God is still doing the abundant. And God works greatest in darkness, whether we want to know it or not. This is why the word of God says where, where sin abound, even more so does grace. And so uh, I was reminded of the fact as I was going through the Bible that uh, uh, these times are not much different than the times of old. Sometimes we even go through things, we think we're going through something ain't nobody been through or, or we're dealing with someone no one has ever seen. Uh, uh, we definitely in America, because we're, we're, we're infants at very best, let alone uh, borderline toddlers as it were, as a nation, a lot of times people forget because God has blessed us so that we're not that old as a nation. And somehow we forget the fact that God has blessed us and brought America as far as she has come. In spite of our trials, difficulties, and tribulations, and indifferences, and, and imperfectness, that, that God still has blessed this country. I said God still has blessed this country. But what the devil would love to have us do is major on our differences rather than uh, 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 hold up the banner of what we most have in common, which is God. You know, the media and the, uh, the tools of darkness would love to have you think that, that darkness is greater than light, but darkness will never be greater than light. There'll never be a name greater than the name of Jesus. Are you listening to me? There is no name that is above his name. 
not in time past, not in time present, not in the days to come. Jesus will always be Lord. And you just keep pushing him if you want and shut your mouth up and roll up like a, a ball of cabbage. He'll cause the rocks to crowd just to remind us. This year, uh, we have anticipated, a lot of folk rather have anticipated, I should say, the eclipse that we experienced. A question was asked in Bible study, uh, uh, after Bible study we have question and answers, what did I believe that significance was? Well, scripture is very clear about it. The eclipse is to warn us. And I, I had a dream, and, and the dream was a, a startling dream, and it reminded me about what the eclipse was really about. And I was in this dream, and, I, and the dream was not a, a good dream, it was a warning. And I woke up, and after I woke up, after having the dream, I began to pray and come up against it. A lot of times people don't understand prophecy is giving for two reasons. One, to foretell what is coming, but it also gives us a time, a space to change what God is showing us. So the eclipse is designed to show us that there is major change. And usually that change is due because there's governmental change or there's a shift in the world, in the world namely, governmentally. And I think that it is a warning to America for us to change, for us to go back to what we started off in, which is God. And so uh, what is the eclipse about? It's a time of shifting. And that's why you see the sun, the moon, they're shifting their positions. And so in that, we need to pray like we've never prayed. We need to believe God like we've never believed God. So whether you're dealing with adversity and you're dealing with challenge times, maybe you've had some challenging news, or maybe you, you are up uh, against something that you need God's help in fulfilling. Just know that God has already given us, and in, in, in specific this week, he's given us a warning in the sky to pray, to change, to believe God. I like to start off by saying as we live in these times of adversity, there is no question at all if we're living in adverse times. All you have to do is stick your head out the window walk down the street, you can almost sense it in the atmosphere. We are truly dealing with adverse times. But thanks be to God, these times are not new to God. The Father holds time in his hand. He knew that these times was coming before we would even be allowed to experience the times. That's how acquainted he is with the times. And so I want to encourage you to recall and to recant as much as you can and starting off, I'm not going to do a lot of review because we're moving forward, but to review the faithfulness of God in your life. I was uh, rereading and going back over the book of Hosea. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the book of Hosea, but the book of Hosea has to deal with one of the first prophets, one of the minor prophets. And in the book of Hosea, it's a very, very interesting book. If you really want to know the heart of God and the character of God, it's in the Old Testament. Because oftentimes we see things and things happen. And this is why people perish for a lack of knowledge. And we're living in a world today, they see things and they get involved with debates with people. And, and oftentimes God get blamed for adversity that we have brought on ourselves or that people bring on one another. And somehow it's as if God is to blame. When God says that I loved you when you didn't love yourself. I took time to, to embrace you when you were lost. And so in the book of Hosea, it has something to do with our message and I want to share this with you. It's important to remember God's faithfulness. Say faithfulness. faithfulness. When you're dealing with adverse times and you're dealing with adversities in life, the first thing 
we want to do is remember that he doesn't have to become faithful to do what it is that you're believing him to do. Look first in the rearview mirror to see how far you have already traveled. Uh -huh. Sometimes we're looking down the street thinking about how far we got to go. Forgetting God has already bought us this far. And we couldn't have come this far without him. And so in the book of Hosea, Hosea calls this man to minister to Israel. Israel has fallen away deep into idolatry and everything that goes along with idolatry worship, the worship of idols. And so he's talking to Hosea and in order for Hosea to, to fill his heart, God said, I want you to know my heart, Hosea. And Hosea's like, all right, Lord. So he gives Hosea this assignment. He says, I want you to get married. Now, that could have been a great thing in that if God had this chosen vessel of honor, but it wasn't. It was a prostitute by the name of Gomer. So God said to Hosea, you don't really understand how I feel about things, but I'm going to help you out. I want you to go marry this prostitute. Now the reason God had him marry this prostitute is not because God was being evil, not because God had a sixth sense of humor, but he wanted God, God wanted Hosea to really understand his hurt and pain that Israel had caused him. I want to say this because a lot of times we know that he's God and because he's God that he cannot be touched with the infirmities of man. The word of God says Jesus has been. That he was a man acquainted with grief. And there are things that can grieve God. And so he had Hosea marry this woman by the name of Gomer, who was a well-known prostitute. He went and married her, betrothed her, brought her home, had three children with her. The third one was in question because the third child name was interpreted, not my people, which means that maybe that child was or was not Gomer's. Well, Hosea's. It was baby, it's baby's mama, but daddy's maybe. So it was in question by the very name that God gave that child if it was even Hosea's child. But if that was not worse, before the child was fully weaned, Gomer booked up. She left. She said, I'm leaving this life. All of this God stuff and and love and compassion, I'm not used to. I want to just pause and say parenthetically, sometimes we deal in adverse situations and, and sometimes God puts us uh, even, yea, in places of leadership and, and puts us in places of, uh, uh, of opportunity, but we deal with hurt people. And hurting people have a hard time adjusting, have a hard time conforming to the opportunity that may be before. And so I think that was Israel. And I think it was evident with Israel when she was in the desert. She kept complaining, getting into arguments. God's laws are not grievous towards her. Do you ever, have you ever considered the reason God gave them the Ten Commandments after they had been in, in the desert for almost two years, it had became obvious they couldn't get along. They were fighting about everything. They were arguing about this, arguing about that, uh, uh, as they were moving towards the promised land. And I've heard a lot of views on, and yes, if they uh, unrestricted, marched straight through, they could have got to the promised land in 13 days. I don't think it was ever intended that they would get there in 13 days. They, it was necessary, just like Hosea marrying Gomer, 
to understand what it feels like in adverse times for who you love to leave you. He said, you will never understand my heart unless you go through it. Sometimes adversity is necessary to build us. Adversity is necessary in our lives to watch it shape our character. Because sometimes we think uh, we're in one place, but really we're somewhere else because hurt and pain had bu abused us before we got to where we are. I believe that was Israel's case as well. I, I, don't, I don't for a moment believe that it was a 13-day journey. Just read it. They had battles with the Amalekites, with the giants. They had battles with all sorts of the ites before they could ever get there. And then when they got ready to go into the promised land, they had to face giants. God had to bring them through battles. They were not just camping out. They were not just eating manna and quail. They were at war. They were dealing in adverse times. God said, I'm going to bring you to the promised land. But you got to understand and you got to know, you have to remember, you have to be ever so mindful of what it took to get to where you are. And I know these seem like some hard times. These seem like some unfair times. But whether you realize it or not, young people, these will be the best days. These will be your good old days. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. I know I'm preaching truth. Can you meet my mama low when we were going through back in the day? Remember the 60s, the 70s? And we thought, oh, wow, it must have been hell warmed over for black Americans. <laughs> Looking back on it now, the 60s, the 70s, boy, I tell you, y'all will never have music like we had music. <laughs> y'all will never have food like we had food. Camaraderie. There's something about adversity that causes people to come together. Think about it. Uh, and I'm just speaking to what I can identify with. Uh, it applies to all people no matter where you come from. But for black people, I don't think we're ever closer than we were in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. When adversity was at its height, we were at our best. Look at it, read history, go back. We believed in God like we never believed in God. We trusted him like we never trusted. Families were closer, knitted together than they ever were. Adversity. My word today is to let you know I got a word for you. Adversity especially when we move, which we're going to be talking about today, that godly adversity. Amen. When you can identify it and know that God is working in your life. I'm talking with somebody, you might be dealing with chronic pain. You may be dealing with a financial challenge. You may be dealing with an unexpected uh, 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 report of illness. You may be dealing with a, a loss, a recent loss in your family. No matter what it is, that adversity, when you're in God, when you're in God, not just of God, don't just want to know the God of the mountaintop, but I'm here to let you know he's also a God of the valley. He doesn't just rule and reign on the mountaintop, but he's a God of the valley. He knows how to get you through the valley to the mountaintop. Thank God for serving a God for moving mountains. But thank God for a God to know how to navigate the valley. Because truth be told, we'll deal more on the valley, in the valley, of the valley, through the valley, before we ever get to the mountaintop. And if you can't handle the valley, if you can't handle the desert, then you don't know if you're really suited, fit, ready for the promised land. I believe in, in God, and it's only God, only God, only God can do it. Only God can do it. He showed me that these are going to be some of the best times. These sudden times of adversity by the choices we make. And throughout history, God has always given man a choice. 
by the choices we make. And don't try to make choices for where you're not at. Okay, let me, let me help you out. In other words, don't give thought. I'm going to use the words of Jesus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added unto you. Give no thought for tomorrow. For the morrow shall bring the evil thereof. And sufficient it will be. In other words, what God was simply saying, seek him first. Seek him first today. Let your choice today be based on him. Don't wrap up your mind as to how you're going to live next week. Now, what I didn't say is don't be a steward over your time. Quite frankly, if you just take that literally and practically, if you take care of your day, your day will take care of its tomorrow. The only time tomorrow caused problems, adverse problems, is when we didn't take care of the day. In other words, don't try to make decisions about things we ain't got control over. Hallelujah. And you know, uh, when you, we, uh, I was also reviewing and just going over another book. Huh. And it was Daniel. And I was reminded not so much about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, though that's a story within itself. But I also was reminded about when we were in adverse times as Israel was in that day. And they were being commanded to worship Nebuchadnezzar. Matter of fact, you're going to be thrown into the fire if you didn't bow down at certain times of the day and worship him. And then Daniel would finally, after coming out of the fire, the three Hebrew boys, even after Nebuchadnezzar saw the Son of God dancing with the three Hebrew boys in the fire, just because he saw God, he still didn't get converted to God. Listen to me. Just because you see something, don't make you a believer in it. That's why Jesus told Thomas, blessed is he that believe and have not seen. And I think we're living in an age people want to see. I can submit to you if they loved ones that may have went to hell would come back and tell them about it. Don't you dare go there. Some of them would still not change their ways. Conviction comes through a humbling of understanding that we have to trust God in all times, especially adverse times with our faith because we have very little control over anything. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream and the dream was that uh, which we now know to be uh, not just a dream in his hour but it was actually a uh, uh, all the way to the book of Revelations to be foretold of the ruling uh, kingdoms of the world. But he saw in this dream the kingdom that he was a part of falling and there was no man to interpret the dream. I went back and studied this out. I'm talking about adverse times in life. We can't be afraid. Fear will stagnate your peace, stagnate your joy, stagnate your promise, stagnate your progress. And so I went back and I studied something I had never really noticed. Daniel was called to interpret the dream, he did. But Nebuchadnezzar gave us insight and it's right there in scripture but sometimes we overlook it. He said, uh, uh, I knew Daniel that you would have the courage to tell me the dream. Even the other interpreters of the dream. The last dream was not that hard of a dream to interpret. I think I could have came pretty close. <laughs> no, and seriously, because after so many dreams have been interpreted, so many signs have been given, there were certain things that just associated. What was D Daniel, how was Daniel different than the rest of, uh, of the king's men? He wasn't afraid. He told him the truth. And Nebuchadnezzar still didn't listen. And he ended up going out to the field, liking unto an ox, eating the grass, and fingernails grew like the claws of a bird. Lost his mind. And then finally he came to himself. And God restored him. And he admitted that God was God and 
He was the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I was reminded that God set kings up and take them down. All kings, good and evil. Do you know that? Don't no one take an office. I know this blows our mind. Don't no one takes an office at any given time without God's permission. But I submit to you, whether it's adverse times or good times, it's based upon our input of choice. And I believe that as long as we make the right choices, God will see us through the times. And that's the part to know. Look at someone and say, God will see you through. I'm going to say this is going to be a strange message because my delivery will not be usual. I want to say that again, and I want to speak to your spirit. I don't know how you've been living, what you've been looking forward to, what's been on the forefront of your mind, but there are some things I think the Spirit of God wants you to know today. And one of the things we have to know as we're moving through adverse times is as long as we're in Christ. We'll get through the times. As long as I stay in him, not just around him, not just of him, but in him, you can make it through. I want to call your attention to a, a story, uh, very familiar, but uh, I want to uh, extrapolate uh, some points out of this story that I think has everything to do with where we are and how God is going to deliver us and how God wants to yea, even bless us. And you're hanging here to the end of this message and you stay tuned on as you are watching. There will be a blessing in it for you. Turn with me if you would. Uh, we're going to go to A very familiar passage to Psalm 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1. Now it'll be up on the screen if you do not have your Bible with you. Say amen when you got in there. It involves a prophet by the name of Elijah. <clears throat> Elijah was a man that knew God, loved God. Elijah was a very unique individual. He was one of only a few men that never ever died. He was caught up. He was a man that experienced probably more miracles other than Jesus. He was a man that had many trials, many tests. He went through depression. He went through alienation, loneliness. Even at one time in a desert under a broom tree, he had suicidal thoughts. One of the reasons I think many people who study, who study the Word of God, and namely the book of Kings as it relates to Elijah, have a greater appreciation because you ask, how could God have done such great works with a man who in many ways are much like us on sometimes and occasions? Let's begin our story. And Elijah the Tishabite, who was one of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, who was the king of Israel at that time, As the Lord God liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. In other words, if I tell you it ain't going to rain, it ain't going to rain. And until I tell you it will rain, it won't rain. But when I tell you it's going to rain, it's going to rain. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook of Cherith, that is before the Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded, uh, commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook of Cherith. That is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass that after a while that the brook dried up 
because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zion, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded, say commanded, a widow there to sustain thee. And so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called unto her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called unto her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, As the Lord God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as I have said, but make me there a little cake first and bring it unto me. And after that, make of thee for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of the oil fail unto the day that the Lord sendeth rain on the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which was spoken by Elijah. Oftentimes in life, we will deal with adverse situations and circumstances, and in them, we will get distracted if we don't keep our eyes on what God said. Just as the adversity came unannounced, oftentimes, or unexpected, so like are the instructions of God. Because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. I want to call your attention back to the beginning. And God gives a word to Elijah. He tells the king at that time, Ahab, who was the worst king many theologians believe that Israel ever had, not to mention his wife Jezebel, which was the most vilest queen that Israel had ever had. And so Elijah's task was to go and minister to Israel because they had fallen away, worshiping idol gods and all the practice that comes along with it. So he enters into this area and as he enters in, he sends word to Ahab that there won't be any rain. Not only was there not going to be any rain, it wasn't going to rain for three and a half years. Now you think we go through a drought here in California. Can you imagine it not raining for three and a half years? I won't get into it, but uh, th th goes along with three and a half years of drought and where they were, animals was dying, diseases, plagues. In other words, it became a plethora of impact. Right? And so Elijah comes to the region at this brook, one of the few brooks that water is still flowing. The very fact that Elijah's there, they don't see this being a good thing. You got to understand, though he was a prophet, he wasn't always received, namely by Israel, because Israel, they weren't thinking God. Oh, come on, somebody know what I'm talking about. You know, even as a believer, as a child of God, just because you arrive doesn't mean you're always welcome to the picnic. Because you alter some of the activities or at least make some folk feel uncomfortable in their activities at the picnic. And I'm not just talking about putting down big six. So is Elijah. Oftentimes when we go through adversities, the provisions that God gives us, and this is what I want you to look for, because now we're talking about faith. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to trusting God. Amen. 
everything you will ever do in your life with God comes down to faith. It comes down to that relationship, what you will give them and what... <laughs> The real difference in a believer's life, now I'm talking to believers, the real difference in your life in the peace that you have can be identified simply, Aaron, with what you give God and what you don't give him. What you give him, you can equate to your peace, your blessings and everything else because God has nothing else to give you. He doesn't have a curse to give you. He doesn't have hurt to give you. He doesn't have pain to give you. He don't have sickness to give you. Somebody can say amen at any time. He doesn't have death to give you. I remember what I said oftentimes, God gets blamed for things. Right? And so, the peace I have is based on what I give him. The peace I don't have is what I choose to keep. So it is my prayer that you intentionally, when you walk out of here today, begin to give God things you haven't given him. Because how he's going to take care of you is not going to be logical. He sends Elijah to this brook. One of the few brooks in the region that still have water. But if that wasn't enough that he sends him to a brook, he's got a drink out of this brook. He says, I'm going to feed you by the mouth of ravens. Now, a raven is like a crow. We, we relate with crows. I don't know if you know it, but crows are scavengers. They eat the dead stuff in the middle of the road. The crows are not like hawks, not like the owls in, in, in the area. They hunt live stuff. As a matter of fact, if it ain't moving, an owl or a hawk ain't got nothing to do with it. But a crow will stand by and wait for it to die. <laughs> These are the birds, and not just a crow, ravens, flocks of them, will come in the morning bringing him flesh. Now, if I was Elijah, the first thing I'm thinking, Lord, are you, are you sure this is what you want to do? Because all they deal with is dead, rank meat, non-fresh. So Elijah has to use, even use faith to even eat this flesh. Amen. Coming from a mouth of a raven. Look at, you, look at somebody and say, you don't know who God going to use. <laughs> See, this is why we got to trust God. Because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And you're looking for an answer in the thing. You don't know who God's going to use to bless you. for somebody to come in a white robe with wings and <laughs> as a matter of fact the raven actually uh, signifies a demonic being or creature so they feed them and this is the part a lot of folk miss it'd be one thing I think and I always like to put myself in scripture to I can better yet ask questions so I said Chris how would you handle being fed by ravens and how long would I last drinking at this brook that I know is in question could I do it for a week could you do it for two weeks how about three and a half years <laughs> these nasty birds bringing you flesh in the morning and in the evening for three and a half years. Sometimes God has got to leave you in a place. And I want you to know, it wasn't that nothing was going on. Sometimes we go through things in adverse situations. I want to let you know, it's not that nothing is going on in your life. God is trying to bring you to a place to see all the things you need to see so that you can come into the revelation of the things you need to come into the revelation of because he's bringing you somewhere. And oftentimes when we re resist the adversity, we resist the training, the trial, when we resist the testing, when we resist the shaping of our character, we delay destiny. You have a whole lot to do with destiny in your life. You have a whole lot to do with the trial you stay in. You have a whole lot to do with how long you're going to be tested. 
I didn't know this for a long time in my life. I thought that I was just there for the duration. And I found, no, God is about purpose. God is about peace. God is about purpose in that as long as the purpose is fulfilled, he is getting no pleasure in the suffering of Chris. God ain't leaving you in an adverse situation because he ain't got nothing else to do. Ah, (laughs) this gets better. Verse 4, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook that I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. God actually commanded these ravens to do what they were doing. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook of Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. And it came to pass. Say it came to pass. After a while. I know you've been in it for a while, but here we go. That the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. He spoke that there would be no rain. Now there is no rain. The brook dried up. Question, was he in the wrong place? No. Was he disobedient? No. As a matter of fact, he's done everything that God told him to do up to this point for three and a half years. I don't know if you know how long that is because some of us can't wait a week. God, you ain't showed up in two weeks. You must be, have forgotten about me. Come on. So we know good and well. Ain't nobody in here. Three and a half years. Oh, let me break it down. That's like three to a nickel in jail. My brothers that may be incarcerated can relate what I'm saying. And here it is. Here's the irony of it because you got freedom to do whatever you want to do every day. But God says, I'm going to put a three and a half year training period in your life. What if you knew that? What if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God says in the next three and a half years, you're going to go through some, but you're going to come out the best. I've got another assignment for you. Your mindset changes how you deal with a thing, Minister Calvin. It changes everything. When I know I'm coming out, I can go through. I don't mind the valley when I know there's a mountaintop. I just get nervous in the service of life when I think that there are no more mountaintops that I am destined and I may die in the valley. But he's a God of the valley like he's a God of the mountaintop. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, verse 8, verse 9, Arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded. Notice he commanded the ravens at first. Now he's getting ready to command a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he had came to the gate of the city, behold, (laughs) the widow woman was there gathering sticks and called unto her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called unto her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, as the Lord God liveth, I have not a cake. I only have enough to make a cake. And that was just a flat bread. He said, I don't eat. She said, I only have enough of that. Ah, I have not enough for a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Now, many people, and I've had questions and answers in Bible study and and different settings as I've taught on this in the past years. And the question would sometimes come up, why would God ask a poor widow woman to do this? And my statement today is when you understand the adversities of faith and when you put your faith to work, why not? As a matter of fact, I think it shows God's mercy as much as the woman who gave two mites. Stay with me. Now, I want to give you a view from Elijah's standpoint. 
he walks into the city gates. Now, when you say that walks into the city gates, that's like he's walking through the gate of city hall. All government is there. All authorities, all those that are leaders within the city are there. And when he walked in, it wasn't a, a welcoming sight. Because see, Ahab and Jezebel put the word out that the reason we're all going through this drought is because of him. He called it. So when he walks through, folk are not going, hey, how you doing, Pastor? No. The reason is what a woman would respond to him is because many believe, theologians believe it had to do with the garb he was wearing. Whether that's the case or not, she listened. But here it is, God told Abraham, I mean, uh, told Elijah. He told Elijah, he says, there's a widow woman that's there going to sustain thee. Now, the first conversation he has with her, I'm about to die. So Elijah, like, you know, I think I had more faith in the ravens than I did. <laughs> this woman said, hey, look, we filled out the obituary for both he and I on yesterday. The funeral's going to be on next Sabbath. See, sometimes what we look to can bring fear. Because even the hope that we can see doesn't look like hope at all. When it looks like there's no way out, when it looks like there's no resources, fear wells up. But notice what Elijah tells her. He tells this woman, he said, don't you fear. Fear not, verse 13, and go do as I have said, but make me therefore a little cake first and bring it unto me after it. Make one for you and your son. Huh. Elijah here has to, in the adverse situations, in the adverse times, he has to believe what God said she will do. When God gives you a word concerning what he said he's going to do, don't put more confidence in people. Don't put a lack of confidence in people. If God said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It don't matter who. If he got to use ravens, if he got to use widow, if he got to use the homeless. It might be somebody homeless that you run into at the bus stop and you talking with them and all of a sudden they give you a word of God. Don't question where it comes from. Just know he's going to do it. I believe also, I believe also one of the reasons God operates like this in our life in almost what I call in secret places is because of the fact he doesn't want the enemy to know what he's up to. He don't want the enemy to advert you in your obedience. Ah. So God, he exposes things to us on an as to need to know basis. Say faith. And this is where trusting God really comes into play. Lord, I'm going to trust you in season, out of season, whether I can, what that look like, whether I can see it, where I can't see it, if I can hear it, if I can't hear it, if I'm qualified, if I'm not qualified. It don't matter what they say the qualifications of the job is. If God said it's your job, it's your job. If God got to open up another company across the street to post a position for you. Say favor. favor. And so this woman hears Elijah when he said, don't be afraid. Verse 14, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until that day. The Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Wow. What a dramatic change in the story. Three and a half years have passed at this point. They standing at the gate. He calls to this widow woman. She got two sticks, probably got wrapped up in a little, little knot, a little bit of meal, and this little vial with a little bit of oil. And she's about to cook her and her son a lump of meal, not even a whole cake and die. Elijah tell, go and make a cake for me a morsel of bread and bring it back. He says, this is heavy. Don't you worry. 
that meal. <laughs> Say, my obedience, my obedience in adverse times. In times. He says that meal and the oil, it would have been enough to say it ain't going to run out. It would have been enough to say it's going to be enough for you in your house. It's, it'd be enough to say, don't you worry about it, Brother Matt. God's going to provide for you and Stella. I know you're going through a tough time. But what about I told you? Not only is God going to provide for you and Stella, but in two and a half years, and then finally in your fullness of your obedience, by the third year, y'all going to be blessed like you have never, ever been blessed. Your now obedience has everything to do with the offsetting of the adversity within a region. Let me break it down for you. He said, you're going to have meal. You're going to have oil. For how long? Until it rains. Look, it's touch somebody and say, God's going to keep you until it rains. Rain signifies blessings. Rain signifies the outpouring, the glory, the change of the environment. Rain signifies, watch this, the glory of God on the eclipse. It may be dark for a moment, but then light breaks through. He told that woman, that woman had to look at him like, are you kidding me? She caught revelation of what the rest of the people in Zarephath didn't know. That it was going to rain in a while. How do I know? Because I got meal and I got oil. Is God blessing you? Is God keeping you? It may not be everything you want, the way you want it right now, but is he doing it? That's my question. Is he doing it? Is he keeping you? Is he blessing you? Are you still eating? You still got a roof over your head? You're still clothed in your right mind. You walked in here, even though you complained about going down two flights of stairs, you still walked up in here. You were able to complain. Oh, come on, somebody. Ha-ha! I had to park way in the back. Thank God you had a car to drive in the park. I said he's still doing it. The oil has not ran out. The meal has not ran out. And all you have to do is take care of each day to walk by faith and not by faith. And the rain is coming. I said the rain is coming. Somebody say, let it rain. Let it rain. Let it rain. Don't you dare look at the drought. It's a preparation period. What you're going through ain't been nothing but preparation. It's all in your perspective. I don't know how long you've been going through. Maybe you've been going through it for more than three and a half years. Maybe you went through a traumatic situation in your life. And God wants you to know, I got a better day coming. I got a day of restoration. I got a day of fulfillment. Oh, you'll live and not die. I decree it. I declare it in a house in the kingdom of God. We'll live and not die. This is what prolonged Israel's journey because they murmured. They murmured. Not only was God telling Elijah to tell her the mill and the oil ain't going to run out as we conclude. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to, according to the word of the Lord. Amen. Ah. I want to end with a, with a testimony. If you would indulge me. This story is very personable to me. When I first got saved, one of the things that I did, I picked up the Bible and I began to read it from cover to cover 
two and two thirds of a time. I was on my last two thirds of reading the Bible. And when I say got saved, I actually got saved at nine, but I didn't start living with God until after I was involved in an explosion and God raised me from the dead and I really wanted to know him and I gave my life to him because he gave me another chance at life. I'm reading this story and at the time I was on disability still recovering from the accident. My wife was the sole provider as it were for our family. She was working at a time, remember your secretary for the county? And so I was at home keeping my one daughter. My wife said I was part-time keeping her because our godmother kept her the most. <laughs> but I'll never forget one day Joyce called me. And uh, that's way before cell phones, so the phone rang and I hobbled. I had my Achilles heel had totally been severed and um, I still was mending from uh, broken sternum crushed ribs and other contusions of the heart and lungs and I was in pretty bad shape and so but God was healing me fast and so the phone rang and Joyce said hey how you doing talking she said so what's for dinner and I said well I took it out but you can call back in a couple hours I'll let you know because see back then we had refrigerators but the refrigerators back in that day they had this little top compartment you just open up one door and the top compartment was called an ice box anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so the reason I say that is because the ice box was different than the refrigerators today there was no humidity control whatever so when it froze it froze <laughs> And so it was just ice all over. I didn't know whether it was ground meat. I didn't know whether it was chicken. So I said, you call me in a couple of hours and I can let you know what we're going to have for dinner. So meanwhile, it was Wednesday. And so that night was Bible study. And I went to Bible study and I had read this story about this widow woman. And keep in mind, we're newly coming into Christ, so my wife ain't really feeling tithing and giving the way that I had given myself. So that Bible study, I had $5 in my pocket. I, ran, I went there and went back in my little Volkswagen on fumes. I took the five out of my pocket and I said, Lord, I know if you did it for Abraham with Isaac, if you did it for the three Hebrew boys, if you did it for the widow woman, I know you can do it for me. I put that $5 in that envelope. I'm saying this to you because faith has to become personal. You have to have your own personal experience. I realize this. I realize I can teach on faith for the next 12 months, Avis, but unless you yourselves as individuals put it to work, you will never know. And so I stuffed the $5, I'm driving home, and my wife is already knowing that we, we pretty much broke. And uh, we were broke at the time, babe. See, she says she never been broke because there was places she could maybe go. It's my message. Let me leave it alone. <laughs> Mac, we are out of money, okay, brother? Now, you can interpret that broke or however you want to interpret it. But here anyway, the story is, so between sometime during that day, and this is, this is really important, Sometime during that day, I don't know when, the male person was probably stopped by somewhere between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock. I'm not quite sure. But I went to Bible study without checking the mailbox. So I had no way of knowing if the mail had came and what was in the mail. So I gave that $5 and I, I, I said, Lord, I'm trusting you. And so as I did that, I'll never forget the next morning waking up. So what's in the mailbox is in the mailbox from the day before. And I see this Sears card. Anybody remember Sears? I don't know if they're still around. Back then it was Sears and Roebuck. <laughs> off of Soto, off of, on the east side. Anybody remember that? The big building Soto? You remember that, sister? Amen. Hallelujah. I remember the popcorns and hot peanuts. 
But anyway, uh, I got the card. Now, I didn't tell Joyce I had spent the last $5. My broke. I'm going to just say my broke. <laughs> and so anyway, you know, that, that reminds me, she's right. Because, you know, women will always keep a little stash. Oh, it's all coming out in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> she laughing. I wasn't broke. You was broke. That's cold-blooded. Ain't that some cold? All these years, I've been suffering. <laughs> and she was saying it up here with confidence. I wasn't broke. <laughs> you know this is a true story. <laughs> She got that from my mama. But anyway. <laughs> so, so stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. So anyway, uh, this, this changed my life as it related to, and I'm just being honest, as it related to finances and having my needs met. My life would never be the same after this. So I took that Sears credit card. It was for $500. I think I'm broke. <laughs> I, well, I know I was broke. She wasn't broke. But I thought that was, I really did in all of me, I thought that's all we had, right? And so I took the Sears credit card. We had only had my oldest daughter at the time. That's when Sears started carrying baby products. So I went and got, I'll never forget, uh, some Loves. I don't know if they still have Loves anymore. But anyway, there was a type of diaper like Pampers. And I went and got her, her Infamil. I'm walking down the aisle, and I'll never forget, I'm walking down this aisle, going to the cash register, and Lord said, stop. He said, look. And it was a chainsaw, an 18-inch craftsman chainsaw. And the Lord said, get the chainsaw. And I'm halfway hobbling right now. <laughs> and I said, well, okay. To be quite frank, it's one of the first times I really heard the voice of God give me an instruction to do something. And it had nothing to do. And I'm sitting there saying, what am I going to do? Maybe it's to cut this mystery meat I got to go home and cook. <laughs> <laughs> I take the chainsaw home. The chainsaw is sitting in the garage. I'll never forget, I'm sitting on this stool. How am I going to tell Joyce? We got a credit card that came. I done went already and used it and brought a chainsaw. So I get home, and here's God. I get home, and the phone rings. And back in the day, no cell phones. I go inside. We had a little bitty house. We are living in Watts on 102nd and Stanford. The house was all but 700 square feet. That's no exaggeration. You can walk through the front. If you leap real hard, you can <laughs> leap out the back. My grandfather's house. And so, so anyway, you, you be quiet because you, you had money, okay? So this, ain't, this definitely ain't your story. So, it, <laughs> so anyway, the phone rings. And I'll never forget this all the days of my life. And it's my uncle, my uncle Paul. He lives on Fifth Ave between like... 52nd and 48th, for those of you who know L.A., a lot of palm trees and over in that area. He said, what's up, Chris Rest? I said, oh, I'm doing all right. I'm all right, all right. He said, he said you still got that, uh, that truck? How the truck running? Is it running? Is it running? Because, you know, we had vehicles, but they weren't always running. I said, yeah, the truck running. And so he said, I was outside cutting the uh, front yard, and I was in the, cutting some trees. Man, I had like two or three people stop by and ask me if I could cut their trees. All we need to do, Chris, is get a chainsaw. <laughs> Real talk. I took the phone and set it down. And I lifted my hands and said, Lord, you're an awesome guy. I picked the phone up. I said, the truck's running. And I just bought an 18-inch Craftsman chainsaw. He said, well, we can start tomorrow. I said, well, I'll get out there, Paul. I, I don't know how much I can do, but I'll get out there. I got out there and started, work, uh, started working. 
Within three weeks, I got my healing. I got my healing. Not only did I get my healing, we started a tree business. Within a year and three months from that point in living in a small, and it was her grandfather's house, mama rented to us for $50 a month. No, it wasn't free. <laughs> she made me pay. <laughs> and so anyway. <laughs> apples don't fall far from the tree. But anyway. So, so here's, here's the point. And one year and three months later, not only did God bless me with my first business, so people ask me, how did you get started in business? Listening to God. Amen. Listening to God. One year, three months later, we're sitting at an escrow office and we bought our first house in Roland Heights on Annadale for $95,500. That was a lot of money then. Three years and a half from then, after that, I, I, I found listening to God was so much greater, so much awesome, more awesome than my problems would ever be. As a matter of fact, I began to interpret my adversities differently. I now today believe when something comes up against me in my life, God's about to do something. It's about to rain. I don't interpret it as a drought anymore. I interpret it as rain. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. So I want you to know it's from step to step in how you hear God. Don't, don't, don't wait to get a whole lot to give. Don't wait to, to, to be in the perfect health and the right condition to serve. It's the little things. If you can't, matter of fact, I'm going to tell you right now, I have people talk about if I hit the lottery, I'm going to get this to the church. No, you ain't. Because if you don't give faithfully not, you ain't going to give it. I didn't say it, the word said it. If you can't be faithful over a few things, how are you going to be ruler over many? Are you hearing me? Yeah. So, Pastor, you saying if I did hit it, not to give it to church, I'll bless it, cleanse it, and no. <laughs> bless you too on the way out. <laughs> no, but on the serious side, sometimes we, we think about if God does this and God does that, He's just looking, saints, for you to do the little things. Start loving people, Amen. being kind to folk. Be nice to your spouse even when they're not nice to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Come up with the money even though they got money. I mean, just, 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 just. <laughs> you are buying dinner this evening. <laughs> Let's give God glory. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. <laughs> oh, give him praise. Would you? <laughs> oh, God is a good God. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Life, wait, what time is it? It is offering time. Time to sow seed into the kingdom. Time to give a portion unto the Lord of what he so graciously, faithfully hath given unto us. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Mm. Oh, he's such a great God. I want to remind you of our building fund. We got a lot going on this week. We're going to be putting up the uh, shades. We're going to be putting up the screens this week. So we're moving right ahead. I want to thank you for your faithful giving and those of you watching online who are faithful partners. Oh, that means so much to us. Uh, we are based and we are dedicated to serving God. And we do it uh, as a team. We do it as a unit. Many other hands that make a load light. But when we all do our part, how blessed that is. It's like the dude that fell down Aaron's head, down his beard, yea, even unto his girdle and his skirt. And the Word of God says when we operate in our giving, operate in our cooperation and unity, the Word of God, like the ravens, like the widow woman, God commanded blessings there in that place. So we thank God that his blessings is in this house. He's blessing you. He's blessing our partners who are watching. We thank God for you. So let's lift our offerings, our tithes,
Don't take from your tithe. That's sacred. It's holy unto God, as our offerings are, but let's give our tithes. Let's not open up a door. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to sow seed into the kingdom that you would be magnified and you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. see from the open windows of heaven to you be the glory and all the praise. With every head bowed, every eye closed, saints praying, believers are believing. If you are here today and you have not given your life to Christ, that is the first step. That's the first step of faith. It's trusting him with your life, with your soul. And he says he's faithful and just to keep that which we commit to him until the day of promise all the way to the end. If you're here today and you want to know that you know you're saved, just raise your hand where you are. You don't have to do it. He'll do it. You want to give your life to Christ today, just raise your hand. Maybe you're here today and you want to rededicate your life. You know the Lord, but you say, I want to rededicate my life. I want a closer walk with the Lord. Just raise your hand where you are. Maybe you're here today and you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just raise your hand where you are. Maybe you're here today and you have not officially. And oh my God, how we all need a covering today. That's a church that we belong to in fellowship with. If you're here today and like to officially become a member of Lifeway Church, just raise your hand where you are. Just raise your hand where you are. Amen. Every head lifted, every eye open, uh, hearts and minds all clear. Uh, we got a couple of announcements. The first announcement is, this is a real important one, February, I mean April 26, 27. From 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., we're welcoming all to our day of prayer. So we're going to have a, a, a day of prayer. Now notice this is on the 26th and the 27th. From 6, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. You don't have to stay the whole time. If you want to come for a portion of the time, that's, that's fine too. Then on that Sunday, which is the 28th, we'll have both services, 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. But that evening... Real important, that evening at 5 o'clock, we will be having a miracle service, a healing service. So if you or you know someone in need of healing, line it up right now. Bring them. 
Even if you are right, just bring them. That, that's a form of ministry. One of the things I like about our miracle service, it's like an outreach. It's a time in which we can minister to people. And this is why Jesus healed them. The Word of God says he went, about, went out healing them all. God had compassion on people. And I say that because a lot of churches are no longer having healing services, miracle service. But we still need to minister to them, Roberto. People need help. And sometimes it's not physical, sometimes it's in their mind. They just need to be reestablished, re-encouraged uh, again. Amen. And then, uh, uh, really excited, everyone was really excited in first service. I trust you'll be too. Uh, this coming month in May, on Tuesday nights, we'll be starting our Tuesday night Spanish Bible study. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. So, in May, we'll have our Spanish Bible study, which will be taught by Roberto and Liliana. Turn around and let them see you. Turn around. Amen. Give them away. Hallelujah. So we want to uh, pray for and encourage Roberto and Liliana as uh, they're going to be helping us kick off. And uh, I want to thank all of you and the team that are, that are helping here at Lifeway in our Spanish ministry on Tuesday nights. Uh, we'll also be operating as a team. And we're going to do that uh, up until which time it fills up. We prove the work. And I'm a big believer about proving what we start. Once that happens, then we'll be moving on Sundays. We'll be moving to a Spanish evening Bible study. Uh, church service. So then they'll be having the Bible study, then a church service. So if you have Spanish speaking friends, let them know about our Bible study. Are you listening to me? You live in Southern California. Everybody in this room know, know at least one Mexican. And you tell them about the word and they're encouraged. Can you imagine they're getting that word fresh? For their own selves. That's why I'm not having these little instruments. And praise God, people do whatever they feel led to do. But I, I don't want to have, you know, you come in here, you speak Spanish, pick up an instrument, and it interprets for you. Why not let them hear the word in their own natural tongue? Amen. Amen. So we're really excited about it. God is doing some great things. We're not just renovating the house, we're renovating people. That's kingdom right there. Amen. We learned something today, family. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Women, quit hiding your money. So let's lift our hands. Hallelujah. Uh, may the grace of God, the sweet communion, the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide, both now, henceforth, and forever be blessed.